Welcome to a lesson in history. Take a deep breath. Because the view from where we are will take it away. This is Oxon Hill Manor, one of Prince George's County's most historic and beautiful homes, and one of its most scenic locales. Ooh, look at that. On a clear day like this one, you can see forever, or at least as far as the Potomac River, all the way to Alexandria. Today, jets scream overhead on their way to National Airport. But back in 1710, Colonel Thomas Addison had problems other than noise on his mind. He had materials on order from England and steamy weather to contend with as he built a home fit for a country gentleman. Today's Oxon Hill Manor was built in 1929 by Sumner Wells. As one of the county's most distinguished citizens, Diplomat Wells was definitely to the manor born. In his role as FDR's Under Secretary of State, Wells would often entertain lavishly at this home with a commanding view. So lovely is the sight that it almost became the official residence of the Vice President of the United States. It would have been a very nice uh, place if you were a hunter or fisherman. Uh, there was elk and deer in the woods, and there was buffalo uh, ranging through the woods because buffalo, that many hundreds of years ago, uh, went, uh, ranged from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Uh, there was lots of fish in the Potomac River. The river had, uh, wasn't, wasn't polluted at all. There was beaver in the streams that they trapped, and uh, uh, I presume there was all kinds of wildlife, and if you'd been a hunter or a fisherman, it would have been a paradise. There are misconceptions about the derivation of the name Oxen Hill. Colonel Addison named the plantation in honor of his alma mater, Oxford University in England. And what was Oxford on the Hill was eventually shortened, as Americans tend to do, to Ox on Hill, Oxen Hill. This looks like one of the places where the plaque reads, George Washington slept here. We can say for sure that this was not a place where he did actually bed down, but one nearby site was definitely on his list of colonial hotels, Warburton Manor. Part of that estate later became Fort Warburton. Do, 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 do. The battlement on the Potomac. Roy, now, you don't look like you're ready to take on the British, uh, except perhaps some British tourists. <laughs> We're here at Fort Washington, about 10 miles south of Washington, D.C., with Ranger Roy Ashley. Now, on this site, in 1809, Fort Warburton rose on the banks of the Potomac. But to keep it from falling into British hands, it was purposely destroyed just five years later. Now, the present fort, now renamed Washington, was completed in 1824. Roy, uh, tell us something about uh, Fort Washington in its heyday. Were there any actual battles fought here? No, as a matter of fact, Fort Washington, like most of the forts on, uh, along the northern part of the East Coast, never saw a battle. These forts were built as deterrents. In the case of Fort Washington, it was built to pre uh, prevent European ships from coming up the Potomac River and attacking the nation's capital. So there was never a shot fired in anger? Never a shot Fort fired Washington. in anger. Uh, right. As you see the fort here, this park was not just one fort. It was a series of fortifications, all of them built to protect the city of Washington. The first fort, Fort Warburton, uh, completed in 1809, as you talked about before, uh, was built to protect the city of Washington. After it was destroyed, then we built Fort uh, Washington here. It served until after the Civil War. Then we built a new system here of concrete gun batteries. As a matter of fact, directly in front of the fort is one of the batteries that was put in during the Spanish-American War. There was eight of these concrete gun batteries here at Fort Washington and four directly across the river at Fort Hunt. Well, thank you very much, Ranger Roy Ashley, for your time. Thank you for coming to Fort Washington. My pleasure. The serenity of today is reminiscent of the quiet but vigilant role that Fort Washington played in American history. Ken and I are going to finish our lunch now. This is the perfect spot for a picnic. And afterwards, I may just prop up my feet and read a good book. 
And what better place to find books than the branches of the Prince George's County Memorial Library System? We're off to the Oxen Hill Library, where they have an entire room dedicated to black history and named after one of America's most noted black women, Sojourner Truth. Some of these are the original walls from the Sojourner Truth School that once occupied this site. Today, people from all over the county come here to this room, named for a woman who championed the abolition of slavery, to probe the roots of black history. Long before the Truth School was established, children in a nearby Chapel Hill area attended another school, one that was short on amenities but high in spirit. Mary Davinger, a highly dedicated black educator, was not deterred by the hard scrabble times. The original school in Chapel Hill was founded in 1798, and it was established through the Freedmen Bureau. And I'm happy to say it was my forefathers that were the instigators of getting the school stopped. And they collected, uh, I think it was 50 cents per child or per family, family to get the school started and to pay the teacher. And that money went towards her uh, room and her board. And the first teacher, Murray Davinger, came from Philadelphia. And believe it or not, she came to, had to come to Fort Washington by way of a, steam, a steamboat. She came down the Potomac and the men in the community were notified to please meet Miss Mary uh, Davinger at the dock in Fort Washington, Maryland. And that's how she got to Chapel Hill. Even with the cost of tuition at 50 cents, a staggering amount for the time and little money for the maintenance of the building, Mary was able to get as many as 57 students. The children of the freed men still had to work in the fields as sharecroppers and could only attend school after the harvesting was done. I used to attend uh, Chapel Hill Elementary School. Believe it or not, it was a little two-room school, sort of on the hill, uh, in Chapel Hill. Uh, I attended, uh, at that time, you went to grades one, two, and three in one room, and then you passed through a little two-foot breezeway to the uh, second uh, room, and that room housed grades four, five, six, and seven. We were still in elementary school in grade seven, and believe it or not, we could not leave elementary school until we passed a state test. Uh, I started school at six years of age when I was at Chapel Hill, and we wore uh, I think very nice clothes because my mother made all of our clothes. <laughs> and basically cotton, we wore long uh, stockings, high top shoes, because that was the style of the day. And we wore our ha uh, hair in braids. Uh, as I said, we carried our lunch, we carried a bag lunch, but had hot soup at school during lunch time. Uh, school took in at 8.30. The hours were from 8.30 to until 4. And we had to walk approximately, maybe a little more than a fourth of a mile up the road to the school. And if you heard the bell, you could hear the bell ringing. It, uh, the teacher used a handbell. So when the bell started ringing, you started ringing so that you could get there and get in the door on time. Uh, school was not out until 4 o'clock. And, you know, we had a lot of recesses then, too, as I recall. We had a 10.30 recess for 15 minutes, and we had lunch and then recess. I think the lunch and recess lasted about an hour. And then at 2.30, we had another recess because we were not dismissed until 4 o'clock. All of the people who made history in the Oxon Hill area did so with little connection to the federal city. Indian Head Highway, which was built during the Second World War, opened up this entire area south of Washington to residential development. But it was the opening of the Capitol Beltway in 1962 that was the real stimulus for Oxon Hill. Now directly linked to Northern Virginia 
and Washington, the towns of Forest Heights, Friendly, Tantallon, and Fort Washington Forest and other communities began to grow. Today, Oxon Hill is poised for more historical leaps. The Port America complex, already rising near the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, will be the largest commercial development in Prince George's County history. The towers and gardens and fountains of this new city will be where early settlers once brought their tobacco and corn for shipment from Potomac Landing. Mia and I, as your official tour guides of the Oxon Hill area, <laughs> suggest that you visit nearby Fort Foote, one of the many defense sites that rings the nation's capital. The community of Silesia, where Germans have maintained old country traditions, and Harmony Hall, home to John and Walter Addison and their new brides. The two of us, meanwhile, are going to harmonize <laughs> over at Rosecroft Raceway as we cheer on They're the trotters to make on our wagers. Ha, the last the of the big time spenders here. here. No fair. They See you next time on a lesson in history, uh, that is, if the Beltway and Wilson Bridge aren't backed up. <laughs> Thank you. 